Well, good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you all. And yes, I look fantastic in a tie. I think it was the last time someone said I could get married in this. Was it the last time? Can't remember. Anyway, uh, let us uh, pray as we come to the word of the Lord in Joel chapter 1. I'll lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your word. Please, by your Holy Spirit, work in us that we might take to heart what he said and apply it to our lives for the glory and honour of your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Christian people all throughout the ages and all over the world have been engaging in apologetics. Apologetics is just a fancy word that describes the practice of giving an answer for why we believe what we believe. Now, there are at least two reasons why Christians want to articulate their beliefs to other people. First reason, the Bible tells us to do it. That's generally a pretty good reason to do something if you're a Christian. Second reason why we want to articulate the things that we believe is because, believe it or not, people ask us to. And if you thought about that, the last couple of weeks, uh, there's been a lot of public uh, media fueled discussion about certain beliefs that Christians hold. Even the ABC, uh, even though it's something of a setup, still want to take a Christian man and put him on their Q&A panel and ask him to give reasons why he believes what he believes. Now, generally, the way to validate a belief in anything is to give evidence. What is the evidence that Jesus rose from the dead? What is the evidence that the Bible is, in fact, the Word of God? What is the evidence that the Gospels are, are accurate accounts? And uh, just as a very important aside, in terms of evidence, uh, often the best evidence for why it is that you should put your trust in Jesus Christ and Lord, as Lord and Saviour is from the lives and the conduct of Christian people. I remember... Uh, before I became a Christian, I knew this guy who I thought was totally weird, and the reason he was weird, he was an Anglican. That's what I knew about him. And uh, oh, he ended up on, the, on my, uh, one of the groomsmen at my wedding. He was a guy that believed in Jesus. And I just saw from his life great evidence that it makes sense to live with Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. If you go into a Christian bookstore, either physically or online, as I did uh, earlier in the week, and you look under the apologetics section, you're certain to find loads of books that deal with evidence for various biblical claims. But there's one area of apologetics that I think has fallen off the radar a little bit or that causes a little bit more difficulty than others. That is the topic of final judgment. Final judgment. I've been asked by non-Christians what I think about creation and evolution, what I think about uh, the conduct of the church, the crucifixion of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, our position on marriage, homosexuality, roles of women, all those sorts of things, and in all those things about the justice of God. But I've never been asked what I believe about final judgment. The Bible teaches very clearly that there will be a day when Jesus comes again to judge the living and the dead. We actually said that as we stood and affirmed our uh, belief in the words of the Apostles' Creed. There will be a day where every person who's ever lived will stand before the judgment seat of God and give an account for the way we've lived our lives. That is a Christian biblical teaching. Now, I can understand why as Christians... We might not want to talk about that too much. And that's basically because, and I've chosen my words deliberately here, it can be scary as hell, can't it? The reality of heaven and hell are in the balance when we're thinking about the Bible's teaching on final judgment. That can be awkward. But another reason I think we might not want to uh, talk about it or, or we might not talk about it as easily is because... It seems that when you give evidence for something, it's for something that's 
taken place in the past, evidence for the death of Jesus, that was a long time ago, the resurrection of Jesus, that was a long time ago. What about evidence, evidence for the final judgment, which by definition, at least as we often understand it, is in the future? Um, it seems a little bit silly. Oh, you're one of those wacky people that believe in this, you know, sort of cataclysmic event at the, the end of time and there's going to be heaven and hell and all that sort of mumbo-jumbo. You, you sort of can't prove that kind of thing in the popular mindset. But nonetheless, there is a logic, there is a chain of reasoning, or if you like, an evidence that the Scriptures clearly unambiguously and continually present about final judgment. And uh, Joel and the prophecy that uh, he has written in the Old Testament, I think actually contributes a lot to that evidence, that argument. And what you might not have thought is that when you actually come to understand the way the Bible gives evidence for final judgment, when you start understanding that argument, you actually learn something about what we do here at church. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons that church exists is because of the reality of final judgment. So when we look at Joel, we're actually going to learn a lot of stuff about what touches us here and now as a, as a church. But let us begin to see what he says. Uh, I hope you've got your Bibles open and you can see Joel chapter 1, which uh, Megan read very beautifully for us. And uh, if you're a note taker, I'm at point one on the outline. Joel begins his prophecy by addressing all of Israel, which in his time I think was actually the two southern tribes of Israel. Israel was 12 tribes, the 10 northern ones have been dispersed, there's two left. That's the Israel I'm talking about. But you'll see that in verse 2, have a look at verse 2, he addresses the elders first and then everyone else. Now, he's talking to everyone, but he makes a point of addressing the elders first. And I think the reason that is, is because he expects that this particular word from the Lord is one that needs to be continually handed down from older to younger generations. And that's what uh, effectively we read in verse 3. Have a look at verse 3. Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. It's an ongoing, continual message. So whatever Joel is about to say, whatever his word of the Lord is, it's going to be a message that will affect Israel continually from generation to generation. Now, of course, all the words of the Lord in the Old Testament were to affect Israel continually. But every so often you get something where it's kind of mentioned that this needs to be uh, 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 taken from the older to the younger, from the older to the younger. The classic example being the Passover and the Exodus. God says, now, remember this and teach it to your children. Remember this. And it, this is one of those fundamental things that's, that's going to affect that, the character of Israel uh, itself. Now, sadly, the thing that is to affect Israel continually is something that's actually shockingly negative. And I think the way Joel speaks it is as if it's a proverb or a saying. Have a look, verse 4. This is the message that should be told for generations to come. Verse 4. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. There's a poetic rhythm here, and the basic point is very clear. No matter what, there's no escaping disaster. If the first bad thing that happens doesn't get you, well, then the next thing will. If the next bad thing happens doesn't get, uh, that, that happens doesn't affect you, well, then the one after that will. Sooner or later, there's something bad is going to affect you. Now, a lot of people and a lot of uh, 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 commentators as well think that Joel is speaking about a literal plague of locusts here, you know, the little grasshopper things, a whole stack of them. Uh, I want to be honest and say up front, I don't think that's actually correct. I think Joel is speaking metaphorically about invading armies. He's talking about wars. And there are a number of reasons, quite a number of reasons why I believe that, but for the sake of time, I'm going to give just a couple, just a couple. If you want to know my other reasons, please feel free to, to come and, and, and chat with me afterwards. But there's a couple of reasons why I think 
Joel speaks of locusts in verse 4, metaphorically referring to armies. Here's the first reason. First reason just comes from basic observations of the text itself. If you look at verse 6, you'll see that Joel mentions a nation has invaded. A nation has invaded. Chapter 2 and verse 20, he speaks of a northern army that God will hopefully drive away from Jerusalem. In chapter 2, verse 25, God himself uses the term locusts to describe the great army that he sent into Jerusalem. That's the first reason. I think the text just assumes that locust is metaphor for army. The second reason, though, is a much more important reason, and it has to do with the Old Testament view of history. Now, every person from every culture has a particular view of history. If you're an Old Testament Israelite, your view of history has two parts to it. Number one, nations will rise and fall continually. Kingdoms will come, kingdoms will fall. Wars will be fought, but it will keep going on like that. Nation rise, nation fall. They'll fight, it'll keep going in that sort of chaotic, uh, uh, ongoing kind of a history. But eventually there will be one kingdom which obliterates all others and lasts forever. It rises and never falls. That's the Old Testament view of history. There's lots of examples of it. A lot of you might be familiar with uh, the one from the prophet Daniel where Nebuchadnezzar has a dream about a great big statue made of all these different materials and and we're told that each material represents a, a different kingdom. But of course, eventually, God sets up his king which rules over all the nations. That's the Old Testament view of history. And I think Joel actually writes his prophecy within that framework. So the locusts and the invading armies are the ongoing sorts of things that are normal throughout history, nations rising and falling. But as we'll see, and uh, particularly next week, there's going to be one uh, sort of kingdom that obliterates all others and goes forever. The basic message is this. Wars will be an ongoing part of Israel's experience, and if you're not affected by one then the next lot will get you. The next plague of locusts will get you. If you're not affected by them, then the one after that. And that's a dreadful message. It's a dreadful message. Dreadful message especially for Israel, particularly for the Jews who are living in Jerusalem. Because as God's chosen people living in the capital city of God's promised land, you'd be pretty tempted to think that you're immune to the normal workings of history. Okay, nations might rise and fall, and they might all fight each other, but this is God's city. That's not going to impact us. But the prophet Joel actually attacks that idea. Have a look at verse 5. Wake up, you drunkards, he says, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste to my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the husband of her youth. Now, as I read through this prophecy uh, during the week, I got a reasonable impression that Joel is probably living in the outskirts of Jerusalem. He's out in the farmland, and he's a nobody. Nowhere else in the scriptures is Joel mentioned. Um, And it kind of sounds like he's speaking to the people within the secure walls of the city of Jerusalem. And he's saying, you ones who are secure in there, you're the ones that are drinking the expensive wine that's been produced out here. Uh, This message is for you. They're the ones that are probably there thinking to themselves, "Uh, no, God's with us. He gave us this land. You know, it was a blessing. Maybe he'll let the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Greeks come and attack our land up to a certain point, but not Jerusalem. That's not going to happen. God lives here. The temple, the house of the Lord is here with us. Sure, he might take away all you farmers that are on the outskirts, but not here. And so Joel, again, 
attacks that kind of attitude. He basically says that an army has come and destroyed all the produce, all the farmland. But that would mean, wouldn't it, that the priests of the temple aren't going to have produce to offer to make their offerings and sacrifices to God. That's the way he thinks. Have a look at verse 9. Verse 9, Joel says, Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. Why? Well, the next line, the fields are ruined. The ground is dried up and the grain is destroyed and the new wine is dried up. The oil fails. You see, what happens outside the walls of Jerusalem actually does have a very negative effect on the people that are in there. It's interesting that the the oil fails at the end there. It's not that the oil is gone. I mean, everything else is, but the oil's there, but it fails. As in the Old Testament law, uh, one of the offerings that will be made to God is an offering from your crop. So you get a good crop. Hey, that's a gift from God. We're in the promised land. God gave us that crop. It's a gift. And so what we do is we take the first bit of that gift, called the first fruits, and we give it to God in the temple. Now, if you've got a lot of grain or wheat or barley or those sorts of things, one of the best ways to to sort of get it into gift form is to bake it into a cake, and so that requires oil. But Joel's saying they've got no grain, they've got no produce, they've got none of this stuff, so the oil fails. There's nothing that the priests have to offer to the Lord, and as we'll see in due course, even the animals that they might otherwise be offering and sacrificing, they're about to disappear as well. Now, according to the Old Testament law, the good crop is the sign of God's blessing. After the invasion, the oil fails, the blessing is receding. The blessing is being removed. Uh, So Joel laments quite bitterly. Have a look at verse 12. This is Joel's lament, verse 12. The vine is dried up and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the joy of mankind is withered away. Put up your hand if you reckon that sounds depressing. Put up your other hand if you're too depressed to put up the first hand. (laughs) Just got to keep you on your toes. Joel is, uh, he's not a happy little Vegemite, is he? We are kind of hope, maybe even suspect that, okay, well, what, what's the good news? You know, prophets of God, typically there's, they've got some condemning stuff, but, you know, is, is the good news next? Well, I've got to tell you, that, that first 12 verses, that was only the warm-up to the horror that is still to come. Joel has unleashed his first plague of locusts, but what they haven't done, the next one's going to do, so to speak. Point two on your outline we're about to hear of a much greater calamity. Joel now addresses the priests directly. Verse 13, he says to them, Put on sackcloth, O priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Mourn, put on sackcloth, he's saying. This is a picture of what it's like to beg for forgiveness. The priests, who really represent all of Israel, they're unable to give something that they owe to God. Remember, the crops, are, are, they're from God. And they give a bit of first fruit. They actually owe it to God. But they're unable to give something that they owe to God. It's as if Israel has a debt that it is incapable of paying to God. What do you do when you've got a debt that you can't pay to God? Well, you seek his forgiveness. Put on the sackcloth. That's why Joel says it. And the same time, there's another thing that you would do also, which Joel then commands. Verse 14, he basically says, go to church. Verse 14, have a look. Declare a holy fast, he says, call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. The word assembly in the Bible is basically the same word as church. 
get a whole lot of people together where God is. We're going to cry, we're going to have the sackcloth, we're going to repent, we're going to beg, beg for forgiveness, and we're all going to come together where God is, that's church, and we're going to cry out to him. That's Joel's response. The problem here, though, is that when we read this, we assume that Joel is telling the priests and the people to act only in response to what's already happened. It is true that this begging of forgiveness and this crying out to God, you know, is, is a result of, of what's happened. I mean, verse uh, uh, 13 there, the, the, the grain offerings and, and, and drink offerings being withheld is mentioned as one of the reasons. But there is a second and much more important reason why Joel exhorts his listeners to beg forgiveness and gather together in the Lord's presence. It is because a much greater calamity is on the way. Have a look at verse 15. Alas, for that day, says Joel, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Now, what's going on here? Let's try and put it all together. There has been a military invasion against the southern tribes of Israel, but Jerusalem itself seems to be okay. But for Joel, Jerusalem is not okay, because what the first invasion failed to do, the next one probably will, or the one after that probably will. It's only a matter of time. God's own house, the temple in Jerusalem, is already in jeopardy because there's no grain and drink offerings being made. So Joel is hinting now the possibility that it will soon be destroyed. Remember the Old Testament view of history? Nations will continually rise and fall, but eventually a permanent kingdom set up by God will destroy all the other ones and will last forever. Well, if that continual struggling of the nations began to impact and destroy God's own special city, and even the house where he lives, then surely you would reason that that would be a time when God would bring in his kingdom. He'd, he'd start the judgment. And that's the way that Joel sees it. For Joel, when Jerusalem, and particularly the temple, is under threat, you know that the day of the Lord is near. And that's the way Joel argues it. Have a look at the way he reasons that final judgment is near. Verse 16, has not the food been cut off from before our eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seeds are shriveled beneath the clods, the storehouses are in ruins, the granaries have broken down, the grain has dried up. How the cattle moan, the herds mill about because they have no pasture, even the flocks of the sheep are suffering. In other words, sooner or later, you can't even make the regular animal sacrifices. They're all going to die of starvation. That's going to be even worse for the temple. And so Joel continues, to you, O Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the open pastures and flames have burned up all the trees of the field. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up and fire has devoured the open pastures. God's special dwelling place, the house of the Lord, is soon to be destroyed. Already the priestly offerings are becoming scarce as the cattle and the herds are soon to die of starvation. And for Joel... When the place where God lives is soon to be destroyed, well, then it follows that the day of the Lord, the final judgment, is close. Get together, says Joel, and cry out because of that day. Now, eventually, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. I'm going to ask a question. It's a real question. You can yell out an answer. Does anyone know... And, oh, by the way, there's a number of answers. Does anyone know when the Jerusalem temple was destroyed? Someone yell it out. When was the temple in Jerusalem destroyed? 70 AD. 70 AD is a very good and legitimate answer. The Romans went and sacked it not that long after Jesus' death and resurrection. That was the, uh, the temple under Herod. Is there another answer? Well done. When the Babylonians came and sacked Jerusalem, that was 
500, <laughs> I didn't prep it, is 586 BC. Any others? All right, now I'm going to ask the question again, but I'm going to give you another little bit of information. According to Jesus, when was the temple in Jerusalem destroyed? Who said it? Yell it. When he died on the cross. The physical Jerusalem temple got built and sacked built and sacked. It was like the locust plague, you know, on and on. Jesus Christ is the true temple, the true dwelling place of God. The Bible says in the book of Colossians that in him all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. But God's temple was destroyed. Jesus said it himself, destroy this temple, I'll build it in three days. They're like, yeah, hey, it's taken years to build this big building. Yeah, the temple I'm talking about, that's my body. So if you take the theology that Joel has and you see the most horrible, dreadful calamity in all of Israel's history, namely the destruction of the true temple, you immediately say to yourself, what's left? The final judgment of the Lord must be here. Interestingly, it only took a couple of days after the death of Jesus, for God to begin final judgment. Now, I'm sorry I don't have this verse written up on the PowerPoint, but I'll read it to you. Acts chapter 17 and 31 says this, For God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. The temple is destroyed, final judgment begins. How do you know it begins? Jesus' resurrection. And yet it still talks about God having set a day. And this is one of the wonderful and yet annoying things about the New Testament. The final judgment has begun already. That's the first thing. Because we are described as already being raised with Jesus. Ephesians chapter, uh, uh, chapter 1. He raised us up with him and seated, uh, seated us at the right hand uh, with God. The judgment, the final judgment, has happened if you are a Christian. And the good thing about that judgment is it says you are justified because the destruction of that temple there was the destruction of your sin if Jesus is your Lord. And yet it remains that God is still merciful despite the most horrible calamity of all, that he still holds off in bringing his kingdom finally in. Why is he holding off? Well, it's simply so that more people can come in to that sacred assembly, to that congregation that have gathered in the name of the Lord, the congregation like us who cry out to God, and we do cry out to God because there are continual calamities in this world. What the locust plague doesn't get us in this generation will get us in the next generation. We live in a fairly secure and free country, but there's nothing to say that that's always going to be the case. We are familiar with sickness, with suffering, with death, with sorrow, with relationship difficulties, depression, anxiety, suicide. There's any number of horrible things that sooner or later will impact and affect us. What the first bunch of locusts don't get, the next one will. So we do cry out to God, but we gather as well, don't we? We gather because God calls us to gather in the name of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. We gather because we are, in fact, part of that new kingdom that God is bringing in that rules over all others. Do keep gathering. Do make church a priority. The scriptures think along these lines. I don't know if you remember, but it's in Hebrews chapter 10. Do not give up meeting together, a summary in the habit of doing, but do so more and more as you see the day approaching. The reality of final judgment is the thing that says, keep meeting. Even better. Even better. 
keep meeting in such a way that more people will join the sacred assembly. Do what it takes in terms of church structure and thinking to try and get more people in. Because that day of the Lord will come. Who can stand? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a God who reveals to us what we need to know. Thank you that you don't shy away from telling us about the reality of judgment. But we thank you that the day of the Lord has in fact begun in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Heavenly Father, to continually trust in him, to gather in his name, to call other people to join and so have the final judgment passed on them as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.